So why solid state cinema? Well, my research group studies the extracellular matrix of tissues, and, and that is the, the, essentially the bulk material that's around the cells in all of our structural tissues, like bone, cartilage, and tendon, and so on. Well, why is that interesting? It's effectively, a, if you like, a dead material. It's not the cell. Well, it's interesting because its molecular structure and its 3D architecture are what tell cells what kind of cell they are and tells them how to behave, essentially. When you think about it, all signaling has to start from the outside. So bone cells, osteoblasts, only behave like bone cells, for instance, when they're in bone extracellular matrix. Now, with age and with disease, that molecular structure of the extracellular matrix, of course, changes, and that causes aberrant behavior in the cells. Now, when you think about it, the the drugs that we use to try and treat degenerative diseases, they all work on cell signaling pathways. But those drugs are gonna be fighting a losing battle if actually what's going wrong is that the extracellular matrix around the cell is continually telling the cell to be something different. And so we figured we need a new paradigm in medicine where we actually treat the extracellular matrix to get rid of or to at least ameliorate degenerative diseases. But of course, before we can do that, we need to know what the normal structure of the extracellular matrix is, so we have a target for what we need to get to. So in very broad terms, and I'm sure you all know this already, the extracellular matrix essentially, in most structural tissue, consists of fibrils of collagen protein set in a hydrogel of proteoglycans, uh, and in bone, those proteoglycans are largely replaced with the calcium phosphate mineral particles, and we'll come on to that. Collagen is going to be the running theme through my talk today because it exemplifies most of the solid state NMR techniques that I'm going to want to tell you about. So collagen is a triple helical molecule and it arranges itself in these uh, very periodic ordered arrays where there's a gap between the head of one molecule and the end of the next. And that means that in the resulting fibril structure, you have these alternating so-called overlap and whole zones. Uh, so if you, for instance, look at the negatively stained TM of a collagen fibril, you typically see this sort of striation pattern. Now that arrangement of, of molecules in the collagen fibril is important for the mechanical properties of the collagen, because the collagen is the main mechanical component in all of our tissues. And it's this so-called whole zone where there's less molecular density is expected to be highly flexible. But it's the arrangement of molecules is important for more than just mechanical properties because the arrangement, of course, determines what's on the outside of the fibril in terms of chemical functionalities, and that determines what the cell is going to see. And that's important because uh, transmembrane proteins like integrins connect to collagen fibrils through very specific binding sites, and that's the sort of outside-in signaling beginning of the process that um, you get allosteric changes from the integrin binding, which causes a whole knock-on downstream signaling effects. So essentially, these binding sites in the collagen fibrils are extremely important for cell functionality and, and health. <clears throat> and so it's really the structure of these binding sites, their accessibility, their dynamics, because of course this is on-off binding, that we need to be able to investigate by solid state NMR. But I hear you cry, how can you study something quite as complicated as a whole tissue by solid state NMR? Well, in exactly the same way you study highly complicated molecules in solution state NMR. We need 2D NMR. We need 2D NMR for structural reasons and to be able to assign the spectrum. And we do it in very much the same way you would in solution state, except we probably make more use of the dipolar coupling than the J coupling. So this is the kind of 2D spectra we use typically in the solid state can be exemplified by this sort of spectrum, where in each dimension of the spectrum you have if you like, the normal one-dimensional, for instance, carbon-13 NMR spectrum. So each of the carbon sites in our biopolymer or biomolecule is represented in that spectrum. And then in the two-dimensional plane, you have a standard, the diagonal signals with each signal correlating with itself. Uh, but the interesting signals are, as in solution state NMR, the off-diagonal signals, which in this kind of experiment are between the signals from carbons that are physically close in space. So for instance, carbon A is close to carbon B, and so if you go down the signal for carbon B, you find that it's correlated with the signal for A. Now the intensity of that correlation signal is roughly proportional to one over R to the six, where R is the internuclear distance. So the pattern of signals here and the intensity pattern, essentially telling you about the molecular structure in the material that you're looking at, which in our case would be the extracellular matrix.
thing is, when you're looking at the extracellular matrix and you're wanting to know about the structure of the different molecules in it, you have to look at the whole intact matrix, because as I'm going to show you, the structure of the molecules changes if you try and take one component out. And that means that you need carbon-13 enriched native tissues, because you can only get those kinds of two-dimensional spectra, as I'm sure you're aware, if you have carbon-13, nitrogen-15 enrichment. And so something we did about 12 years ago now was we developed what we call the heavy mouse model. Heavy because basically we feed that mouse 30% of its amino acids that are fully carbon-13 and nitrogen-15 enriched. And that means that its tissues, such as its bone, end up sufficiently enriched, around 20 to 30% enriched, so that you can record exactly that kind of two-dimensional carbon-carbon correlation spectrum. You can assign those spectra partly by reference to NMR chemical shift databases, although I have to say the collagen proteins are rather underrepresented in those databases. So more often we actually make synthetic peptides of, of fragments of collagen-like proteins uh, and we label those and we use the, those as references to start to assign the spectra. Now you can also in solid state use dynamic nuclear polarization where you exploit the very large electron spin resonance of an, a radical that you add to the sample at very low temperatures, usually around 90 Kelvin, and you transfer the electron spin to protons and then you cross polarize from protons to carbon-13 as we've done in this case. And that for native tissues we found gives you a, uh, an enhancement of signal to noise around a factor of 80. And that means that you can see in your carbon nitrogen correlation spectra, even very, very small signals. Sorry, I haven't got my glasses on, so I can't, I'm pointing randomly at signals here. But you can see the signals from collagen intermolecular crosslinks. Now, there are only about four of those per collagen molecule, and a collagen molecule is around 3,000 amino acids. So to pick out four carbons specifically out of 3,000 amino acid residues is pretty neat. So dynamic nuclear polarization NMR is really making a huge difference in the solid state, and particularly with proteins. The problem with DNP is that it normally causes line broadening because, of course, you're freezing your protein down to around 90 Kelvin, so you pretty much stamp out all molecular motion. Bizarrely, for the native tissues, and I think it's something to do with the sort of the antifreeze properties of a native tissue, we don't actually see that much line broadening. So this is really going to be a, it's going to be a game changer for us. Um, we can also do heteronuclear correlation, um, as just as you would in solution state, and here we're correlating proton with carbon. Now, if you're used to solution state, I hear you screaming what horrible line widths you've got in the proton dimension, and indeed we have. The issue here is that proton-proton dipolar couplings are incredibly strong, as you can imagine, and even with magic angle spinning, you only partly spin them out. Now, you can spin at 100 kilohertz, and that, that pretty much does for your proton-dipolar coupling. But if you spin a native tissue at 100 kilohertz, I can tell you it comes out looking pretty weird. So we don't do that. We spin around 10 kilohertz and, and everything stays nice. Keeping the native tissue hydrated is a major issue. And often we end up actually freezing the sample to ensure that. But what we've done here is we have correlated proton and carbon. And the resolution at 10 kilohertz is sufficient that we can see this little signal here. And this signal is the, the collagen glycine amide proton. And the reason that's neat is because all of the glycines in collagen are involved in the intrahelical bonding. There's what holds the triple helix together. And it happens through the glycine amide proton, essentially hydrogen bonding to a neighboring chain carbonyl. So we can actually follow the, if you like, the integrity of the triple helix through following the hydrogen bonding, strength of hydrogen bonding in this signal. And all we've done in this experiment is we've washed out from the collagen fibril its native proteoglycans, which normally help to hold the fibril together. And you see that we're moving the signal when we do that to higher chemical shift, i.e. stronger hydrogen bonding. In other words, this triple helix is, if you like, shrinking in on itself when we remove the proteoglycans. It becomes stiffer. So another, this is the first message on why you really need to be using native tissues if you want to study native structures. Now, as you, can, you might imagine, assigning the chemical shift spectrum, whether it's carbon or nitrogen or anything else, when you're dealing with a native tissue, is somewhat of a problem because we haven't got just collagen in there. There's fibronectin, there's a whole range of proteoglycans. In some tissues, you also have elastin. So we've had to develop a range of techniques to help us assign what's what in that spectrum. And I just want to throw out there all those people who work on deep learning. There's really something for you to do here because we can manufacture extracellular matrices with different proportions of those different proteins in and we could really do with some help in how to assign spectra with a sort of deep learning or um, 
kind of trawling through the, the, um, the data that we have. But in this case, what we've done is we've uh, used a gadolinium complex, a paramagnetic gadolinium complex to edit the, in this case, carbon-carbon correlation spectrum. And what it does, of course, paramagnetic complex, is it knocks out the signals from any of the carbons that it's close to. So you can see it's knocking out signal here in the alpha carbon region. And this alpha carbon region here, it's actually associated with an alpha helical structure from the chemical shift, so it's not collagen. Uh, it's not the collagen triple helix, but there's some protein with an alpha helical structure that clearly the gadolinium complex is associating with. So we then use TEM to spatially image where that gadolinium complex is, because gadolinium, of course, is a heavy metal. And we see that it's associating with the collagen fibril whole zones. It's making them dark, uh, knocking the electrons away in the TEM image. And so we can assign this signal here to being the proteoglycans that would normally be associated with the collagen fibril whole zones. But you don't actually need to assign these 2D NMR spectra to make huge use of them. There are a range of different 2D spectra we can record that give us all subtly different information about the structures or the assignment of the spectrum. And between them, that collection of 2D spectra are representing the underlying molecular structure. So they are, if you like, a fingerprint of the molecular structures. And so you can use those spectra directly to compare molecular structures between tissues. And that's something we did really early on to compare the structure of in vitro grown tissues that we grew from primary cells in the lab to compare them with in vivo tissues. And this is actually a, ca a case with osteoblasts. We've got fetal sheep, primary osteoblasts that were growing in culture to make a bone-like tissue. And I can tell you when we started doing this, we just had one big central blob of signal in the middle of the 2D correlation spectrum because the tissue that those cells were producing in culture was nothing like the in vivo tissue. And before we had this kind of comparison available, there simply was no way of telling whether you had a, a tissue in vitro that was anything like in vivo. The only way you could do it was to implant it into an animal, back into the host species and see if it was rejected or not. And if it was rejected, well, it wasn't a good tissue, but it didn't tell you why. But here we can actually begin to rationally assess what's different about the tissues. And then you can refine your in vitro culture to get to something highly similar to in vivo. And I'll show you a little bit later on just how similar this osteoblast tissue is to the, to the in vivo. So once we've got those in vitro models, we're then free to label different proteins because we can label them at different points in the culture. We can label with different um, uh, amino acids. We can label with different nuclei. So we then start to explore some of the biological questions. And one of the first ones we, we are interested in is how collagen fibrils can both act as mechanical support, so they're being moved around. As I'm moving, my collagen is moving, but still provide well-defined ligand binding sites on a molecular level. Now, the cells have no control over your movement, but they have to control their binding sites. So how does that happen? And the other question we were asking at the same time, which we didn't think was connected, but you'll see turns out to be, is why does the collagen protein contains so many proline hydroxyproline pairs. So collagen proteins consist entirely of glycine XY triplets, glycine something something, and glycine proline hydroxyproline is the most common. And you can see from on the right here just how many proline hydroxyproline pairs there are, because I've highlighted all the prolines and hydroxyprolines in pink, and where you've got a large band, you've got a proline hydroxyproline pair. There's a substantial number. Now, of course, the reason there's lots of proline hydroxyproline is because the, uh, the amino uh, ring forces a twist down the peptide backbone, which is actually what gives you that twist to enable a triple helix to form. But to get that twist, you only need a random distribution of prolines over the X sites and hydroxyprolines over the Y site. There is no reason to have them together in order to get that twist. So what biologists believed was that the proline hydroxyproline being in a pair together caused for a very stable structure uh, and that that was what stabilized the triple helix. And so that the proline hydroxyproline pairs seemed like a good place for us to be starting our studies of the structure of collagen triple helices in vivo, as it were. So the backbone structure of proline hydroxyproline depends very much, of course, on the conformation of the immuno side chain ring. And I hardly need to tell any of you that. So we're dealing largely with prolines and hydroxyprolines with a trans uh, conformation, but the, the ring tip can be endo pointing towards the peptide backbone or exo pointing away. Uh, and that gives the backbone a very different dihedral angle, typically of the difference by about 15 degrees in collagen proteins, but it can be more. 
and NMR provides you with a, an excellent way to determine whether you have an endo or an exo ring, because as you might imagine, the car gamma carbon at the tip of the ring, its carbon-13 chemical shift is very different when you have an endo or an exo conformation. The proline rings and the X sites are expected to be in the endo conformation because that gives the backbone dihedral angle pretty much the right value to fit into the triple helical structure at the X positions in the glycine XY triplets. And by the same token, you expect hydroxyproline to be in the exo conformation. So we used our two dimensional experiments to assess what the proline and hydroxyproline ring conformations were, but specifically in glycine proline hydroxyproline triplets. We use the proline effect to do that, and we use this double quantum, single quantum correlation to pull out slices of carbon spectrum which contain the gamma and delta carbons for those prolines, specifically in these triplets. And to our surprise, what we see are signals that are almost exactly halfway between endo and exo. But to some extent, it wasn't a surprise that there was some movement, because what we expect is those rings to be flipping very rapidly, even in the solid state. So we expect some sort of averaging between the endo and exo uh, chemical shifts. What we didn't expect was that the populations of the endo and exo would be exactly half and half, and they clearly are. And that's so clearly we haven't got a static situation. We haven't got a stable ground state. We've actually got very much a metastable state where those rings, the proline rings and the glycine proline hydroxyproline triplets are really not bothered whether they are in the endo or the exo state. So we then went on and did some energy landscape modeling with our colleagues, David Wales. And what we found from that was that there is a huge area of Ramachandran space that these proline rings can basically be wandering over with essentially no energy input. The intriguing thing is that as you flip endo to exo, the collagen triple helix is actually compressing and extending. So actually what's happening here is that the collagen triple helix is, is, is extending and compressing at these glycine proline hydroxyproline triplets, essentially with no energy. So they can, it's a completely flexible joint, if you like. And in contrast, if you take something like a glycine proline alanine triplet, alanine, of course, you'd think of as a, a fully, more or less fully flexible amino acid, there's essentially a single ground state structure for the proline in its endo and exo states. Well, that doesn't mean, of course, the proline can't wander outside those conformations or outside those structures. They certainly can, but you have to put energy in to do it. So in, by contrast, this is a much more rigid triplet structure, completely in contra contrast to what we were expecting. So rather than having static, non-flexible regions here, actually what we have is very much metastable states for these proline rings and the glycine proline hydroxyproline triplets. And the reason that's interesting is if you look at where those glycine proline hydroxyproline triplets actually are in the fibril structure, they are far from randomly arranged. So here is the fibril structure. This is one period of the, fib of the periodic structure, and I've aligned the collagen molecules as they would be in that fibril structure. And I've highlighted the glycine proline hydroxyproline triplets in red, and you can see that they occur very much in patches or even bands across the fibril. Now bear in mind, this is where the triple helix is compressing and extending. So it's actually compressing and extending across the whole fibril, not just in one molecule, but the whole fibril at these points can compress and extend. So these are, if you like, expansion joints in the fibril. And then look at where the cell adhesion sites are. Well, the integrin binding sites are here in dark blue. The von Willebrand factor binding site is in green. They are always associated with these bands of proline hydroxyproline triplets. And so we hypothesize, and unfortunately, I think it's almost impossible to prove or disprove, those bands of flexible glycine proline hydroxyproline triplets are actually controlling the dynamics of integrin binding. And they're controlling that even though your collagen is moving around all the time as you're moving. Now, what happens to that structure when you, are, when you have various diseases going on in your body? Well, the answer is huge amounts of things. What typically can happen to your extracellular matrix is what I'm going to call accidental chemistry, non-enzymatic chemistry, or in other words, chemistry the cell has very little control over. So it's things like oxidation, or as I'm showing here, glycation, the reaction of reactive aldehydes like glucose, like ribose 5-phosphate, with terminal amine groups, or particularly lysine, but also arginine. Now, the best known products of that chemistry, the best documented, are these intermolecular crosslinks. 
best documented because most of them fluoresce and so they're easy to spot. And the ubiquitous result of glycation chemistry is stiffening of the collagen fibrils. And so it's always been assumed that these intermolecular crosslinks are high in abundance. They're the end stage products. They get there, they make the collagen stiffer. But actually there is no experimental evidence that says that these crosslinks are in fact the major or dominant products in collagen fibrils in vivo, or even that they exist. So we actually were able to follow the chemistry of glycation with solid state NMR. We've done that in several model systems as well as some naturally occurring systems. So we take ribose 5-phosphate as a model glycator that might occur in cell necrosis, for instance, and glucose that's typical for aging. And you can follow the chemistry through these two-dimensional carbon-carbon correlation spectra that I've already been showing you. Now, the huge surprise, the first huge surprise was just how many products we got. We see signals from all kinds of products, but they are all these monovalent modifications of lysine side chains. By solid state NMR, we see absolutely no evidence of intermolecular crosslinking. Now, NMR is not the most sensitive technique, so it may not be that there's no cross-linking there. It may just be that it's too, too low in abundance for us to see, but it's there in much, much lower abundance than these single modifications to lysine side chains. And when we measured the total cross-linking by LCMS, it's actually less than in a normal collagen fibril. It's less than in a pristine fibril. There's some intermolecular cross-linking from glycation, but it knocks out enzymatic cross-linking. So what's going on? I'm going to have to switch away from NMR very briefly to explain what's happening here. We did some TEM with some negatively stained glycated and unglycated fibrils. So in negative staining, you fill your sample with a heavy metal, urinal acetate in this case, and urinal acetate are my orange blobs. And so they, it tends to fill the collagen fibril whole zones. And that's why you get this typical striated pattern in when you do TEM of negatively stained collagen fibrils. But if you look closely within that pattern, you also see these very fine bands. And that's from where this heavy metal stain, the urinal acetate, sticks to bands of charged groups. So it's really showing you how superbly aligned the collagen molecules are, that the charge residues line up so beautifully that you can actually see them through the, uh, the arrangement of the urinal acetate stains. Now, when you glycate your sample, well, first of all, you lose the contrast uh, substantially between whole and overlap zones, basically saying the whole zone doesn't really exist to the same wholeness as it was before, but you also lose the subbanding. And that's basically telling you that the charged amino acids are not aligning so well as they were. In other words, the alignment of the collagen molecules in the fibril has rather been disturbed by glycation. And that means that our beautifully aligned flexible regions are no longer beautifully aligned. Basically, the molecules in glycation are all moving around longitudinally here. And so what was a nice flexible region on the collagen fibril is no longer flexible. And to demonstrate that, if you put your fingers together with the knuckles aligned, I align the flexible regions, you can bend the whole structure. But if you slightly slip them, even slightly, you can't bend. So the only thing you have to do to stiffen a fibril is to mismatch the flexible regions. And that's what happens with aging in glycation. So that's the accidental chemistry. What about cells? What do they do to modify the matrix? Well, probably they don't modify any more than they ever do in cancer. So cancer cells or cancer-associated fibroblasts, some of the first things that they do is to modify the extracellular matrix around the tumor site. And they typically modify it in a way that allows cancer cells to escape. And they escape using the integrin um, process pretty much as any other cell uses to move uh, to essentially crawl along collagen fibrils. There are many other mechanisms of cell uh, invasion, cancer cell invasion. I'm just picking one here to exemplify the fact that modification of the extracellular matrix is primarily what allows the cancer cells to move. So we wanted to understand just to what extent cancer cells might modify the extracellular matrix. So this is just one very brief example. Again, it's a carbon-carbon correlation spectrum. Uh, and we were simply looking to see to what extent the collagen glycosylation is affected by uh, cancer cells. So collagen molecules are always glycosylated. It helps to ensure that the uh, cell binding sites are arranged outwards by having hydrophilic sugars either side of them. And what you see is in the rat osteosarcoma matrix, and this is just a cancer cell line, so this is, this is a, a very much a model system. 
the glycan signals we see are massively intense compared to what we'd think of as normal osteoblast bone matrix. And there are very many more species present. And that tells you immediately the collagen fibril structure is massively disrupted. Almost certainly there's more access to cell binding sites, i.e. cell crawling sites. And moreover, this is information you can't really get from proteomics or LCMS. Because to use proteomics and LCMS, the first thing you have to do is get rid of the glycosylation. So this is information that people just don't have at the moment. And I emphasize that over and over again, is that NMR is very good at looking at post-translational modifications. And there are very few other techniques yet that can do that. They will, they're getting there, and proteomics in particular is doing some amazing jobs with phosphorylation. But glycosylation is an absolute pain to do anything with, with proteomics. Mass spec does not like sugars. So NMR is a really beautiful way of doing that. Another thing cells do that is they get really upset is that they calcify the matrix. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. But in vascular calcification, you get the calcification both of the intimal layer of arteries as a result of atherosclerosis and cell necrosis, uh, and rather more sinisterly in the medial layer, the elastic layer, uh, around primarily the collagen fibrils and elastic laminae um, in medial calcification, typically associated with aging and diabetes. And this is work I've been working on with Cathy Shanahan at King's College London, who is a bona fide vascular biologist. I met Cathy at a conference just like this in 2003, and we've been working on this ever since. So in the, in the medial calcification, you typically get calcification of collagen fibrils. The, the mineral aligns around and within the collagen fibrils, occasionally deposits of these sort of blobs. In atherosclerosis, it deposits very much more of these sort of random huge plaques in places where the collagen has been depleted by cell necrosis and degradation. Um, so we have a, a very nice uh, in vitro model of vascular smooth muscle cell matrix, and we simply oxidatively stress the cells in that matrix. And we were, what we were actually looking for was the co co collagen glycosylation, because we, we had made the assumption or hypothesis that under oxidative stress, the cells would be producing very differently glycosylated collagen and thus differently structured collagen fibrils. And what we saw as the cells started to calcify their matrix was the, these signals here started to appear. Now, these signals here could not be accounted for by any kind of protein glycosylation. By NMR, we were able to assign, obviously, spatial connectivity. So we realized very quickly we were dealing with a five-membered sugar ring. Uh, with some other experiments, we realized we were dealing with a phosphorylated sugar, and it wasn't DNA or RNA. And eventually, we, went, we worked through many, enough NMR experiments, this is entirely NMR-based, and determined that this molecule was poly-ADP ribose. Now, as a chemist, obviously, you get excited about a molecule like this with these pyrophosphate groups, because this looks like the perfect molecule to gather calcium, to deliver to collagen fibrils, and calcify the collagen fibrils. And at the point where we discovered this, it wasn't known what the molecule was that did that job. It was clear that something did that job, but nobody knew what it was. However, I have to say, eight years ago, when we discovered this molecule, we also had to take a bit of a step back, because at that time, the only documented role for poly ADP ribose was in DNA repair in the cell nucleus. So there was really little evidence that it was ever even outside the cell nucleus, some, but definitely not outside the cell. But when we looked at patient atherosclerotic plaques, and this is from a carotid endirectomy, we find that poly ADP ribose is not just not in the nuclei, it's all over the place. It's all over the place to the extent where it cannot possibly just be inside cells. And then we looked at our osteoblast model, and we, we have an osteoblast model that we can induce the cells to calcify their matrix as well, to produce bone-like matrix. And there too, we found as calcification started, we found also poly ADP ribose. So it looked like possibly this was some sort of universal mechanism that was happening to calcify the extracellular matrix. So we then did the obvious things. We investigated which of the poly ADP ribose polymerase or PARP enzymes was responsible for this synthesis. Uh, and both PARP1 and PARP2 were upregulated in both our models, PARP2 mostly in the vascular model. And with inhibitors of those enzymes, unfortunately, there are lots of those because obviously PARP1 is, a, is a, an anti-cancer target. We found that actually it was the selective PARP2 inhibitor, minocycline, which did the best job of inhibiting both vascular and bone calcification. So I, I'm sorry, I'm away from NMR, but I will get back to NMR. Just briefly to say, we then tested 
that hypothesis in vivo that a, a PARP2 inhibitor would alleviate vascular calcification. So in, a, in an in vivo rat chronic kidney disease model, it's essentially high adenine, low protein diet that was um, carried out with our collaborators in Belgium here. We found that uh, dosing with minocycline, the selective PARP2 inhibitor, essentially rescues that uh, vascular calcification phenotype in these animals. And it does it in a dose dependent fashion. Now in that model, you also have high rates of bone turnover. So we expected that the, the um, the bone in the treatment animals would have some effect from being fed a PARP2 inhibitor. So in the, high, in the chronic kidney disease animals, we see more or less normal bone calcification, but when you measure the rate of bone turnover, it's very rapid. And indeed, the treatment animals with the uh, PARP2 inhibitor, you essentially see osteoporotic bone. So it looks like PARP2 at least, is actually involved very directly in the calcification. And so just briefly to say what it might be doing, well, in vitro, polyadip ribose gathers calcium ions like crazy. Uh, it's selective for calcium. You don't get this effect with magnesium or any other divalent metal ion. When you introduce collagen fibrils, those uh, dense liquid droplets preferentially localize around the collagen fibril whole zones. You don't even see them, those droplets left on the grid. They all localize with the collagen fibril whole zones. And then if you add phosphate, the collagen fibril calcifies in very much the way it does in the vasculature and in bone. And it, it does that in a sort of a periodic density manner. In other words, the mineral is more dense in the collagen fibril whole zones, which is expected. It's always been shown um, by experiments on in vivo bone that the calcification appears to start in the collagen fibril whole zones. And what's very interesting is when you glycate the collagen fibril, that glycation chemistry I was talking about earlier, you no longer have that beautiful biomimetic calcification. Instead, the, these polyADP ribose calcium droplets coalesce in multiple layers alongside the collagen fibril, uh, and they eventually solidify into something like this that looks very much like what happens in the collagen depleted areas of the vasculature. So it looks as though polyADP ribose is acting functionally to induce calcification of the extracellular matrix, and it looks like it's doing it by having a specific binding site on the collagen fibril, particularly it close to the whole zone. That's what it appears for the pristine fibrils and the fact that when we glycate, we seem to disrupt that calcification would suggest there's a selective binding on collagen fibrils. Now, when you think about it, when your bones calcify, there's calcium phosphate going out into your extracellular matrix, and there are probably a hundred different proteins and structures out there that could act as nucleation sites. But in fact, it's just collagen fibrils that calcify. It's just the collagen fibrils that gather the calcium. So there must be some way that the collagen fibrils are somehow tagged or marked out for calcification. And one way of doing that, of course, is to have a selective binding site on those fibrils for the, the deliverer of the calcium ions, namely polyADP ribose. So I was musing over this, talking to David Neuhaus, or to be more fair, David Neuhaus heard a lecture of mine and said, had you thought about the binding of polyADP ribose on collagen? And to be fair, probably we hadn't. So he reminded me of this paper. This is actually a really beautiful paper where uh, David's group have used solution state NMR to uh, determine the structure of the polyADP ribose binding site on this nuclear protein, APLF. And that binding site consists of pi stack tyrosines here and here, and the adenine root of the polyADP ribose slots in to that tyrosine, and the nearby arginine has a charge charge interaction with the pyrophosphate group. So after this conversation with David, I went back and I had a look at the collagen structure, and I looked all down the triple helix, and there was no such binding site. And then I remembered the C terminal, N terminal. They're kind of small, but they're kind of important. Uh, and actually, there was the binding site, and it's 100% conserved through all animals that have collagen type 1. It's actually really remarkable, this degree of conservation. So whatever that sequence is for, it's for something incredibly important. Um, so we then investigated that, and we've investigated this a lot, and we actually have now mounting evidence that, in fact, the alpha-1 chain in the collagen C-terminal is responsible for binding polyADP ribose, that it's disrupted by glycation, and here's why. So the alpha-1 chain, this triple helix, there's three chains, two alpha-1s and one alpha-2. The alpha-1 chain at the C-terminal folds back and it produces this perfect polyADP ribose binding site. Well, that was our hypothesis. 
the alpha-2 chain, which actually pretty much at the same position spatially, also has a potential poly ADP ribose binding site. So essentially in this C terminal, just here, you have an absolute mass of potential poly ADP ribose binding sites. And remember those binding sites are periodic because the collagen fibril structure is periodic. Poly ADP ribose is of course periodic, it is a genuine polymer. And so potentially you have multiple binding sites going around the collagen fibril <coughs> and they're going around the edge of the whole zone, exactly where we expect calcification to, to happen. Now we've done lots of NMR on this. I'm just going to show you very briefly one example just to show you what NMR can do in this field. So fortuitously, the only tyrosines, and bearing in mind tyrosine is expected to be key in this binding site, the only tyrosines are this conglomeration in the C-terminal and two in the N-terminal. And so in our osteoblast culture, we put in carbon-13 labeled tyrosine. Uh, and then the first thing we do is to have to check that what we actually got as our main signals in our carbon spectrum are those from tyrosine. Because when you have so few tyrosines in your molecular structure compared to, for instance, glycine, it's quite possible that you'll see natural abundance carbon signals more strongly than your label. So you can determine which ones are labeled, of course, by doing 2D NMR, because you'll only see carbon-carbon correlations for the, uh, the labeled, in this case, tyrosine. And all of our major signals we can assign to tyrosine, so that's fine. Actually, there's so much poly ADP ribose in this culture that it even appears at natural abundance. So this is the very, very earliest stages, right? Uh, PhD student uh, Adrian Magocci managed to capture that very early stage of calcification in this culture, which I have to say was not easy uh, and took several months. Um, but he was, he was bored during lockdown, so he kept coming in and doing that. And then we do this experiment. This is a Redor experiment. So what you do in this experiment is you record the normal carbon spectrum for the sample, and that's the blue lines. And remember, most of those are due to the labeled tyrosines. And then you re-record that spectrum with a dephasing pulse sequence on the phosphorus nuclei in the sample. And that has the effect of dephasing or reducing in intensity any of the carbon signals that are due to, uh, to carbons that are close in space to phosphorus. So in the control experiment where the sample has not been calcified, the extracellular matrix doesn't have any calcium phosphate, those two spectra look identical, the control, sorry, the reference spectrum and the redor spectrum. But in the mineralized sample, essentially all of the tyrosine signals except for the beta carbon show reduction in intensity, showing that a substantial proportion of the tyrosines in our collagen are close in space to phosphorus. And what we don't know if the phosphorus is the pyrophosphate groups of poly ADP ribose or the initial amorphous calcium phosphate phase that's forming uh, in our sample. There's always going to be calcium phosphate around poly ADP ribose because it is such an avid calcium binder but we're now working with uh, selective frequency uh, dephasing on the phosphorus to try and work out what it, to what extent this dephasing is due to poly ADP ribose and to what extent it's due to the mineral. But essentially, David, if you happen to be out there, thank you very much because I think you spotted the binding site for us. Um, and that's really important because with glycation, this fold unfolds. This arginine gets glycated. It's because it sticks out from the fibril. It's very accessible. Uh, and what we've seen over and over again is the unfolding of this, uh, this side chain, sorry, this, uh, the, the C terminal. And so glycation, aging, has a horrible effect on calcification. All right, in the very last few minutes, the final step in all of this, we've been studying calcification now for about 15 years, is what induces the whole process to actually start. So physiologically, it happens in bone, um, but it only continues to happen in bone when you stress the bone. So famously, astronauts lose bone mass because of the lack of, of strain on their joints or on their bones when they're in space. And pathologically, calcification happens in damaged tissues. But you can damage a tissue over and over again. You can put calcium in there. You can have calcium dysregulation. You can have oxidative stress and you don't get calcification. And then suddenly you do. So what is the key factor? We know that pathologically to get calcification, we know you need calcium dysregulation, we know you need oxidative stress, but you need something else too. And one day I was sitting in a lecture and it suddenly occurred to me, kind of duh, the thing that tissues have in common when they become calcified, they're all tissues subject to adverse strain. So your bones are subject to normal strain, but when they're not, they lose calcification. In the vasculature, your arteries are the thing that calcify, not the vessels so much. And of course, your arteries are pumping all the time. And when they become damaged, 
there's adverse strain on the tissue that's left behind because there's less tissue taking the whole strain. When, when tendons and ligaments calcify, it's because they've been ruptured. It's because they've had undue strain. And I suddenly start to think, my God, the thing we've missed all this time is that actually there's mechanochemistry going on in the matrix. Because then there's this big wider question, when the tissue's damaged, how do cells know what the kind of damage is? How do they know what to repair, how to repair it? How do they know whether to repair it more than it was before or just fi fix what was there? There has to be some kind of flag in the matrix that tells cells, if you like, the historical strain that's been going on in that tissue. There has to be mechanochemistry. And shortly after that, a group in Heidelberg published this absolutely beautiful paper with EPR, where they showed that when you take a tendon to rupture, you create organic radicals. And that's just a beautiful finding because it just tells you there's then so much chemistry that can happen if you've got an organic radical floating around. And they hypothesized that those tyrosines in the collagen C terminal would then be very susceptible to oxidation because they stick out. And that would also change calcification but it also can give a signal to start calcification. Because the thing we notice in all of our osteoblast cultures is the collagen's all disorganized and then suddenly the cells start to strain it and they strain the collagen and they line it up in doing so. And at a certain point, then they start to calcify it. And I was going, hmm, how do the cells know that the collagen is sufficiently aligned to start calcifying? It has to be aligned, otherwise you calcify random collagen, it becomes a mess and a brittle mess at that. And the answer is because as you start to strain the collagen, you start to break crosslinks and the crosslink breakage gives you a product that the cells have a receptor to detect. Now, this is really, really, really early days in this work. Uh, and we started with tendon, not bones and not, uh, not blood vessels, because we wanted to start with something that was almost pure collagen. But what we do find when we take those tendons to close to break point, and there's small changes, but we do see small changes in the spectrum, in the aromatic region and in this sugar uh, region, aminal region. I should say, I'm only showing you one spectra here, but we basically do this 12 times. We take mouse tail tendons, this is the royal we, we slit them in half, so one half is a control and one half gets stretched, so it's a proper control. And we basically only think we've seen something if we see it in at least 10 out of those 12. So the, the we is, to, is Thomas Cress, who's a PhD student, who's been extremely good at doing all of this. There's an age-related effect, as you'd expect, because the cross-linking in collagen is different as the, as the mice age. And I can't tell you what the products are yet, but from their chemical shifts, they're things like uh, peptide bond hydrolysis products. Now, whether that's through um, homolytic bond fission or whether it's because essentially in straining the collagen molecule, we've reduced the energy barrier, for hydrolysis reactions to occur, we don't know. But um, the ERC have just given us funding to study this for, for the next five years. So now we're going to produce heavy mice so that we can actually get 2D NMR spectra to really look at some of these products. Uh, um, I think it's remarkable that NMR is able to pick out that kind of information. And you simply can't get that information from anywhere else. Once we know what those products are, we can go looking for them in LCMS, but we can't until we know what they are. So I'm not going to read through the conclusions. Um, I, I, I'm sorry it's taken a bit of a time to get through this with my computer being tricky. And these are the amazing people that actually did the work. Um, and as I say, the uh, European Research Council grant is about to start in October. Uh, and I'm delighted with that for all kinds of reasons, not least of all to still be connected with Europe. It's an amazing thing. Uh, and the ERC is an amazing institution. Um, but Ying Chao, uh, did the heavy mouse work, absolutely instrumental in that. Thomas Cress is doing the strain work. Um, Rakesh Rajan, Dave Reed, and Karen Muller, these people are the people that actually keep the group running all the time. So thank you very much. <laughs>